everyone. Thank you for joining us for episode 12 of Ask the Howlers, our cybersecurity expert roundtable. This week, we are going to be focusing on all things VMworld. Now, for those of you that haven't come to an Ask the Howlers session yet, uh, this is really just a bi-weekly session that we do. We try to keep it to 30 minutes or less. Uh, and it's really just about talking about what's going on in the industry uh, from a security perspective. This week we had our annual conference for a company called VMworld. So we're gonna be focusing on, on chatting about that. Uh, and just some background on the howlers. So the howlers are made up of a diverse group of individuals here at VMware Carbon Black from all different parts of the business uh, that are really just here to, to talk about the different focuses that they work on on a day to day. Um, they get a lot of exposure in the trenches to what you're working on from a customer perspective, from a prospect perspective, from a training perspective. So it's really great because we get to bring people um, from all over the business to come and talk security. So before we hop in here, I wanna do some initial intros. My name is Stacia Timpanic. I am a solution engineer here at VMware Carbon Black. And I'm gonna kick it over to Evan to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Evan Hernandez. I'm a senior security technical marketing manager with the VMware Security Business Unit. And Ryan? Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Hendricks. I'm the training manager here at VMware Carbon Black, uh, managing the team of trainers we have across the globe for all of your training needs. Awesome. All right, guys. So we just completed VMworld. Uh, and what we've decided to do for this session is have everyone bring their session pick, right? Which one did you really take something away from? Which one did you enjoy most? I'm going to start with my pick of the week. Um, it was the session from the Senior Director of Threat Intelligence that came over from last night at last line. His name's Giovanni Vigna. And he did a session on how Threat Intel can help your security posture. And the reason why I picked this was I thought he did a really good job of talking about, first of all, um, when you're looking at from a SOC analyst perspective or security researcher perspective, you know, security folks are kind of like the goalies of a soccer game, right? Like there is such a large surface area that they have to defend. And typically goalies are not being applauded for not letting goals in, right? The only time that they really get attention um, is if something gets past them. And that's similar to how, you know, security analysts feel. I always say that about people that work in support. I'm like, no customer is typically calling you to be like, hey, just wanna let you know, everything's going great, right? You're typically just getting called to get yelled at from a perspective. And so the idea here is how can we be better about detecting um, or improving our security posture. And I thought he did a really good job of breaking it down. One of the things that he mentioned that we're doing here at VMware from a VMware, from a security intelligence perspective is threat trajectory research. And I thought this was really good time to bring up an article because our threat analysis unit here at Carbon Black just did a bunch of research on how we are being able to track active command and control servers. And so to kick off kind of the conversation, how do you guys feel about network IOCs? Like, what do you think of them? Do you feel like they're high fidelity? I'll start with you, uh, Ryan, in terms of what you think about network IOCs in general. No, I, I think they're great when they're applicable. Uh, and that window of time when they are applicable and relevant can vary greatly depending on the attacker's use of those network-based IOCs. So whether it's domain name, whether it's the IP addresses being used. Uh, fortunately for me, I came up on the network side when I first got into IT. And so I really have this passion about IP addresses and IP configurations and DNS and how it works. And we, we talk about how easy it is to change your IP address and attackers know this and can do it. So while those IOCs are relevant with an active command and control or an active exfiltration or an active malware campaign, they're great and really awesome to have to be able to bring that intelligence into your system. But just as quick as they were being used for malicious activity, they can then be a legitimate customer's IP address now from that ISP that is now being blocked or causing false positives because it's no longer being used in that way. And so I think they're really great while they're active. And I think that's always been our challenge is 
how do we make sure that they're active and they're relevant and they don't just sit there forever and never kind of go back and reevaluate? Yeah, I have to agree with that. Like I remember uh, even to this day that we'll get, someone gets a network IOC indicator and even just the amount of time it takes to research to figure out, is this active? Is it not active? Um, and some of the feeds just alert on things like this site collects cookies. Like that's not helpful, right? That's like <laughs> every site that's out there um, since GDPR, like every site I go to, I have to click, click, except that it collects my cookies, you know, like it's just crazy to me that um, there, that could be an IOC because you're, you get to a point where it's like, all right, now I'm just getting fatigued by network IOCs. Um, and so one of the things I think that's great about the research that we're doing is that we're finding active campaigns. The most prevalent we find is Cobalt Strike that's out there. They're active C2 servers because most of the time, the C2 servers that we get notified about are commodity malware attacks, right? They're not targeted. They're not uh, specific. And so I think that this is some really great research. And at, to your point, Ryan, one of the things I like is that our Tau team is going to clean them up. So if they have not seen the command and control server be active for 30 days, they'll start to purge that data out, which I think is great uh, overall. Um, and Evan, any thoughts on this in general in terms of the network IOCs? Anything you yeah, I think, I think you hit two points on the head, right? It has to be active and mm -hmm. th they're indicators. So, you know, I look at it like my ring, right? As, as cars drive by, I get alerts and alerts, but it's not anything actionable that I can take. So being able to take that telemetry and, and provide it back makes it more actionable. Um, because again, like you said, if, if it's no longer active, then how do you really tell whether it's a valid um, IP address or a DNS request versus it being you know, compromised? Off topic question. Question for you, weirdest thing you've gotten on your ring doorbell surveillance or coolest thing? Uh, a bear sleeping upside down. Oh, do they normally <laughs> do that? Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think so. Uh, he was just on my, on my front porch, just lying there on his back, like he owned the place. <laughs> Ryan, can you beat that? I don't know if you have a ring doorbell. Uh, I cannot. And I live in the middle of the desert. So bears walking past my house is not a thing. Um, and, and, in, and in fact, I probably don't have any great example other than just seeing random things that just pop up. Um, I feel like my mom knows every time a cat's outside and she'll, she'll be able to like, she has the ring sensors and she will know that one of the cats is outside. It's like cat lady powers. It's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's move on from talking about cats. Um, I also just wanted to mention that before we move on, um, I thought it was Cool, I did a VMworld throwdown session with Joe Bagley. If you guys have not seen it, go check it out. It's really quick, it's a good time. I was really excited to do it, but petrified at the same time. But otherwise, let's move on. Ryan, what did you pick? What was your favorite sessions from VMware? Yeah, I, and I, I will admit, I am a fan of going to conferences or going to any of these of demos. I like to, I don't wanna hear somebody talk about what's going on, I wanna, I wanna see it. Uh, and so I'm going to call him out, even though he's here with us, uh, Evan's demo about the, essentially the, the workload security that we're bringing together, this idea, this concept of that intrinsic security. Uh, so if you did not take a look at the intrinsic security keynote and see his demo on kind of how those are going to work together and what information we can grab, really great, gives you that hint of what the future is bringing to us. So I do want to call that one out as being a great um, on-demand recording that you can still get access to. And then to dive into a little bit more detail, there was the comprehensive workload security, going into more of the explanations on it. So kudos to you, Evan, um, awesome job on that. Love to see those demos, because then Thank it makes you. it seem it's real, right? It's not somebody talking about what we're gonna bring, right. it's you saw that demo. Um, yep. But switching gears from there, uh, one, of the, one of the ones that I really enjoyed, and uh, if you weren't able to attend the session by uh, Rick, McElroy on the, you know, strategies for overcoming the security and IT talent shortage. Uh, we all know that it's there. We all know that it happens, but um, it was one of the professional development sessions uh, by Stephanie Gunter, who's an employee here at VMware, 
for transferable skills, how to survive through the digital transformation was really a great presentation where she talked about her just varied background in positions that she's had and how you can take different skill sets and apply them where you don't think they can. And I think I've had this conversation with individuals when we talk about the shortage of security professionals and we're always looking for a security professional. Like we want to bring them in as a security professional and we don't think outside the box where if you are developing a front facing website, you don't need to find a security expert that has some web coding skills. Just go find a web developer who's really interested in security. You know, if you want to know about your SQL injection attacks and what you have available, go hire yourself a database administrator. They're going to know everything there is to know about that. And so it's taking that idea of you have these skills and, and taking them out of your normal place and putting them to where they may not fit, or you may not have automatically put them to fit. And whether it's creativity, whether it's some other, you know, challenge that you faced. I really enjoyed that because often I think we have individuals who don't meet every requirements for those security positions that we need to get filled. And so they're like, oh, I, I don't fit everything, so I'm not going to apply. Uh, so I think anybody who's looking for anything, anybody who's out for a job change wants to get into the security space. Um, even coming from the VMware teams, you know, those vSphere admins who want to get into this, like come join us on the security side. Think about those skills that you have and, and bring them over. So I thought that was really a great one, kind of outside the security scope, but very applicable to anybody who wants to come to the security side and join us. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think about people, I didn't come from a security background, but I came from a teaching background. And I think that has helped me be able to show different people the value of the product in different ways, right? Uh, one of the things I've always learned is like some students will learn to your point, Ryan, like through a demo, like they need hands-on. Other people like diagrams, other people like being talked to versus, uh, you know, virtual meeting, in-person meeting, everyone's different. And so just finding what clicks for people is something that I went to school for and didn't necessarily have the cyber part of it, but brought that in over time. Uh, so I, I definitely agree with you on that. And I actually went, one thing I'd encourage other organizations to do I went to B-Sides Boston this past weekend and uh, they actually had on, they used Discord for their, you know, virtual conference, if you will, their platform. One of the cool things they did is they had a section that was specific to job finding um, and people could just go in there and just ask any questions they want. Um, Mark Finder did a great presentation on, so you really want to be a CISO and gave insights into like the life of a CISO, the different phases about what you should do beforehand, how to get the role, what to do afterwards. And I just thought it was really eye opening because you would think, right, a CISO would be a technologist, but they're actually not. They broke down like a day in the life. It's like 60% of the day is meetings um, and 40% you know, 20% is paperwork and 20% is technology. So it's, it's really uh, eye-opening to see that CISOs are more business folks. And you may not think of that off the bat. If you're a security analyst, you say, oh, I want to be a CISO. You may actually regret that <laughs> if you could start to go far enough down the line. So I, I think that that's an, that's an awesome point. Evan, what's your background? Did, are you, did you come from cybersecurity before you came to VMware? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's been a passion since my high school days, you know, breaking into stuff. Um, prior to VMware, I, I worked for a large media company doing all their open stack and cloud security. Um, you know, and even then it wasn't really popular. So I run like two OWASP chapters, a lot of web application security and things like that. But um, yeah, I completely agree. My, my thing was I shifted a little bit from security when it wasn't so popular to <laughs> VMware administration and security architecture of infrastructure. And that gave me a good understanding of everything, right? I think to, to Ryan's point, you have to leverage what you know in other areas to get better. Um, so leveraging my VI experience inside of security and understanding how infrastructure works is was beneficial um, but also uh, on the flip side is being taking that those different roles and then applying them uh, to security yeah i know that for us we were really glad when uh, we met evan and I mean, Carbon Black met Evan, because we were all like, help us be better on VDI. <laughs> and we all kind of <laughs> yeah. looked at Evan. <laughs> and I, yeah. I think that's kind of cool, right? Because 
we are a company that we were always security mindset, whether we like to say it or not, right? right. And now we're, both, we're, we're tossed to infrastructure folks, and now we have to wear both hats when we're mm -hmm. innovating or building product out. Whereas other players in this space that aren't, you know, uh, like end-to-end -end testing within VMware probably don't have to, that thought process, right? Right. Yeah, you know, and I think, you know, we talk about hyperconverged everything, everything being built in. As, as we evolve in technology and as people, we start to, the lines start to get blurry as to what we do in security, what we do in development world, and what we're doing in infrastructure. So, you know, now more than ever, I feel like your background is going to get broader, which is a great thing, right? Because our skills will be able to translate in different areas and we can learn from each other. Um, but yeah, it, it can be tough as well. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, I think it's something that we're going to see just even, you know, as being a part of VMware of getting into that, uh, me personally, when I ran a previous training organization, you know, I ran the ESXi server that we set up all the training labs on. So we've set up VMs to have them get into infrastructure and be able to set things up. And then I got into the security side. So then VMs were spun up on an ESXi server for me to be able to launch attacks and show those and right. demonstrate those or set up a vulnerable web application. And it's funny because then I dove first, you know, into all security, like, oh, forget all that ESXi stuff and let me focus on here. And now it's like come full circle. I'm like, oh, I probably should go brush up on that and bust out one of my old servers and see what I can play with and, and how I can do it. And so it's really awesome yeah, to see that. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point. I think a lot of us forget that the hypervisor and virtualization is everywhere. So when a breach does occur, 90% of the time, it could be a VM, right? So understanding and tying those things together to your point is like now it's full circle because you just need that there. Yeah, 100%. And actually off the cuff question, you know, we, now that we're starting to offer more agentless capabilities, uh, and have some hypervisor options. You know, one thing that a lot of my customers are pushing is I don't want any sort of agent. I don't want any sort of service running on my boxes at all. And I do wonder, like, is it really possible for us to do full on security and not have something touching the clients? I would argue that would be really, really hard to do, especially with the attack surfaces today with fileless attack and, and living off the land attacks that are consuming a lot of memory for their attack surface. I'm curious what you guys think. Like, do you think there's a world where we could be completely uh, nothing touching the clients at all and just sit in the hypervisor? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I, I think, the hypervisor provides us, if we, if we look at the hypervisor and what it's done in the last 20 years, there's layers of abstraction there in general on how we do compute network and storage. I think we'll get to a point where we'll be able to have enough visibility from the operating system into the hypervisor where we can have separate trust domains. We can, we can mitigate a lot more attacks because it, everything is abstracted. But in my opinion, you're still gonna need something on the operating system because we don't know, we don't own that. So it could be a service, it could be something where we leverage you know, our hypervisor technology in a way similar to what we're starting to do with VMware tools and just get more context. I think the more context we have from the abstraction layer and the operating system layer will give us more a defense in depth approach, right? Because when you look at the hypervisor or, or you know, the hyperscalers, hypervisor attacks are uh, not normal and they're very rare, but when they do occur, they cause a lot of panic. So being able to have some attestation in the, in the host and in the guest operating system in a distributed fashion just gives us better security. Brian, what do you think? Uh, so I'm not an engineer. So I say, yes, it can happen. Uh, Cause I don't have to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I know, right? Out. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, for me, much, much like Evan's approach in, in, in what he said, I think there is the ability, you know, when you start to think in that layer of the hypervisor, there are plenty of things that the hypervisor can know that is going on, you know, whether it's accessing those resources on the network or whether it's accessing some other resource where the hypervisor can take that action and prevent it. 
but ultimately you're not solving the problem, which is still on that computer that's inside of that hypervisor that's doing something. Right. So I think, yes, we can control what's being done, but if you want to truly stop it, get to the root cause, like that's inside of the operating system. So I think that's to the point where you need something on the system. Sure, we can block that malicious IP address that we found or that command and control that, or that exfiltration that we saw because it's not within some east-west traffic or some policy. Sure, we can do that. I mean, to be honest, firewalls have been doing that forever. But if you want to address yep. the issue on that endpoint that is inside the hypervisor, you need something there to do it. And whether that comes in through VMware tools or, or that is some other application that's installed on there, that's ultimately the problem for engineering to solve, not me. Yeah. I just get to train about it and tell you how awesome it is whenever it happens. Yeah, and to be honest, there's no panacea where everything is secure, right? I, I look at us as the Tesla or the car in general. When in back in the 60s, no seatbelt, then we evolved to have seatbelts, airbags, and four-wheel drive, and all these safety features. When you look at a car today, right? It, it's, it's leveraging different components to get that data to prevent you from having an accident. But at the end of the day, you could still get into an accident because you can't really predict user behavior and what happens outside of your control. So, you know, we can be as secure as possible, but at the end of the day, you have to have a, an approach where you mitigate risk. And I like zero trust, defense in depth, you know, all those things where you limit lateral movement and stop dwell time as soon as possible and you're winning in the game. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, anomalous cars are gonna fix all that, aren't they, user behavior? <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, argue, no. <laughs> uh, in Massachusetts, anomalous cars or driving cars are gonna solve a lot of the problems because in Massachusetts, no one merges when people get onto highways. So. Uh, I think it's going to be big for us, at yeah. least in Massachusetts. So you're going to see our, our like crash rates come down substantially. Um, <laughs> all right. So Evan, you're up. What were your special picks from VMware? VMware. Um, I think, uh, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I think the session around VDI, to your point, Stasia, is critically important now because uh, a lot of healthcare institutions leverage VDI, understanding that you can put you know, EDR, NGAV inside of that desktop and not lose performance and gain some visibility uh, becomes critically important. And then um, from one of my colleagues, Peter is the practical guide to zero trust, right? Uh, I love, and I've always been a fan of the zero trust model, principle of least privilege. Gives a great overview of how that can be accomplished with our products and what you can do to leverage technology in your favor, as well as the team that surround the whole infrastructure. So those two things um, are great because to me, they kind of marry uh, in and of itself, right? If you have, if in, in the pandemic, when you need to be working and you're home and you get a virtual desktop, it's an operating system. You know, there could be some attacks that the company wants to mitigate. You can't predict user behavior again. So balancing security and performance and being able to do your job is critically important. I think those two sessions can have a great balance for those. Yeah, whenever I think about zero trust, you know, and even if it wouldn't prevent every attack, like nothing's gonna prevent every attack to your point, Evan. It's about how can we mitigate a large percentage mm -hmm. of our attack surface and even something as simple as two factor. Um, it is simple when you think about it, but it, you know, there's a lot of cultural buy-in that needs to happen for something like that. But right. uh, things of that right. nature that can just mitigate at least known malware commodity-based attacks, uh, I truly do believe they're, they're the bang for the buck, if you will. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Well, guys, I really appreciate you coming on. Before yeah, we do this segment. Do the, oh, just oh. the low-hanging fruit stuff, then you're, you're playing with it. We just had Evan go into robot mode. RIP, Evan. Uh, but <laughs> we might have lost them, but that's okay. That's that's the truth about working remotely, right? Uh, you never know when your neighbor is going to start streaming high volumes of bandwidth. Uh, all right, so we are going to finish out with a bonus question. Since Evan became a robot, but it's just me, and Ryan. The question is: pumpkin pie or apple pie? Uh, so you hit on a uh, weakness of mine. 
I'd say just any pie. Ooh. Um, I, I actually love both, but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go with pumpkin pie, especially because we're in the fall time. If you were to ask me any other time, I'd probably say apple pie. Uh, in fact, my, my daughter made me an apple pie cheesecake for my birthday. Whoa. Rather than a birthday cake. I know. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, amazing. Uh, but because we're coming up on the holiday season, pumpkin pie is my favorite. However, my caveat here is pumpkin pie, anything else? So pumpkin spice, coffee, pumpkin spice, everything, I just, I can't do. And every year I try all the different types of pumpkin beers uh, and some are good, some are not because they feel like they just poured in pumpkin spice and called it a day. And, and to me, it's pumpkin pie is special. Um, I just want that pumpkin flavor every, oh, and everything yeah. else. Yeah. Very interesting. Pumpkin pie. Oh, he's back. He's back. <laughs> he's back. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to give you my honest opinion. I like both, but if I had to pick, I, I do love a good pumpkin pie. I like pumpkin spice lattes. I like pumpkin beer. Last year, I waited till the first day of fall to have a pumpkin beer and they were pretty much gone. So this year I started like midsummer, like as soon as they were on the racks, I went, I bought the $6 jar of cinnamon and sugar to put it on a rim. Uh, so I, I am totally in for pumpkin pie. Apple, I like apple crisp, but I can never find a recipe where the crisp gets crispy enough, quite frankly. So um, the, real, the real question now is, since all three of us said pumpkin pie is, ice cream, Cool Whip, or whipped cream, or cool. plain? Cool Whip. <laughs> I can't believe how many people don't know that Cool Whip exists. It, it is a, it's such like an, un, it's so amazing. It's so amazing. But I yeah, it's very underrated. Cool Whip on top. Oh, stop it. I need, that's what I'm having for dinner. Pumpkin pie. <laughs> Ryan, what are you, what's your go-to? What do you do? I, I'm actually, I'm a purist, just plain pumpkin pie, nothing on top. I agree. I'm a purist. Yeah, I need that pumpkin oh. flavor in the pot. <laughs> that is, that's, Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, well, that says a lot about a person, doesn't it? Um, all right. So thank you, everyone, for coming to today's session. Thanks, guys, for coming and joining me talk about VMworld. Let's talk about the next episode that's coming out. It's going to be a special segment. We're going to be focusing on cyber forensics, homeland security. Uh, and so if you want to tune in for the next Ask the Howlers, we will be here. We will be ready. Go enjoy some pumpkin pie, and we'll talk to you all later. Thanks, everyone. Take care.